This week, the Synod on the Family kicks off in Rome. We find out what married couples are telling the Holy Father, and we go inside the Synod Hall. and welcome to this all synod edition of Vatican Connections. This week we're going to take a look at just what's been going on at this highly anticipated meeting. Now at the first working session of the synod, Pope Francis made some brief introductory remarks welcoming the synod participants. Then, once the media was out of the way, he announced that the official working language of the synod would be Italian from now on. That means the Relator General can give his opening and closing speeches in Italian and not Latin. Another thing that has been eliminated, the Vatican will not publish full texts of each participant's intervention. Why? They say it's to create an environment where Synod Fathers will speak freely without worrying about what the headlines will be the next day. But we do know what the lay experts are saying at the working sessions. Each session begins with a witness talk by a lay expert on the topic of the day, and we've spoken to some of those experts about what they told the Synod Fathers. We shared our story about our own upbringing with our family and, and how that's impacted us uh, from a faith standpoint. Even though our, our families maybe were not intentional, they understood that there was a God present in, our, in their marriages, and that was the witness to us and both of our parents. Uh, ha marriages were uh, 50 plus years. Well, the central message that we wanted to bring is that, quite frankly, the Catholic Church has it right. We have the truth. We have the right content. But what we really have to focus on is how do we roll it out to the common people, the people that are not inviting us into their homes, the people who are not opening up what we're, what we're writing. We have to find a way to find um, a home in their houses, in their little domestic churches, something that is friendly, something that is positive, something that is hopeful. And I think when we do that, they're going to see that the church really does have the best message. The first couple to speak were the Parolas from Australia. And we should warn you, some people found their witness talk just a tad too frank for the Synod Hall. But the Pope did ask everyone to speak freely. So here's what they said about their presentation. We've been, we've been married 55 years and uh, in that time we've known great joys and also times of difficulty and, and frustrations and tears but you know we still love each other very much still very much in love and that's that's the, the mystery a great wonderful mystery and I think behind all that is often the decision to love and also a lot of forgiveness um, and always looking at the goodness in the other person. Um, I'm, a, I'm a doctor, I teach students, and one of my students asked me, what's the secret? And I said, the secret actually, statistically, is to pray together. I know that sounds very unusual, but you, prayer is fundamental. And the other thing I would say is sex. You have to recognize that the sacrament of matrimony is a sexual sacrament, and we express our spirituality most fully in sex. So it's part of God's great gift for us. So I think that's part of the secret. And one of the most anticipated talks came from Jeanette Touré of Ivory Coast. She's the president of the Association of Catholic Women in her country, and she's also married to a Muslim man. She spoke about her 52 years living what she called a life of mutual respect of each other's beliefs, of supporting each other, and of educating their children in the Christian faith. She referred to the family as the place where one learns to be social and learns how to deal with difference. With all of these issues, the discussion arrived inevitably at how doctrine and pastoral action go together. Archbishop Paul-André Durocher of Gatineau talked to CNS about that fine balance. <music> One of the growing realizations as I'm listening to my brother bishops is that church teaching has to be rediscovered not as a set of rules 
but as a true good news, a good news that frees people. Uh, God's plan for marriage is not a structure in which people have to bind themselves in order to somehow gain God's love. God's plan for marriage is a gift of God's love for us. We have, I think, a lot of work to do, not just the bishops, but I think married couples, faithful married couples, we have a lot of work to do to find out ways of expressing that. Why is faithfulness a gift? Why is uh, fruitfulness in marriage a gift? Why is fidelity to one's partner a gift? Why is reconciliation a gift? In which ways do, do each of these aspects of church, church teaching become a way of life for people? And so when you look at it that way, then the tension between um, teaching and uh, pastoral care disappears because we discover that the teaching itself is a form of pastoral care. The question on everyone's mind, of course, is how are the Synod Fathers themselves reacting to these interventions and what are they proposing? What issues are they raising? What are they reflecting on? Here are the Synod Fathers, in their own words, telling us about what they said in the Synod Hall. If we are to say um, married, divorced and remarried Catholics can freely receive communion. What happens to the man who is a, not a Catholic, but he's married to a Catholic, and then he takes another wife in the polygamous site or setup, and um, he wants to, on occasion, wants to come and receive communion? On what basis are you going to refuse him? Jesus didn't say, I want the easiest cross to carry. He took what was coming. And I think that in many instances, um, married people who find themselves in impossible situations, second married people, um, may be just called to, to do that, to carry the cross with Christ. Um, do, we, do we say that you don't have to carry the cross? Because the world says, no, no, the soft, the soft option is always the easier one. And ultimately, is it the easier one? How do you get your children to marry then if you don't get married? Or if you are married, you, 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 how do you get your children, let me put it another way, get your children to make a lifelong commitment if you have failed to do it yourself. So I think this is where uh, we've got to look at all those kinds of issues as well. For, but for us in Africa, I think the situation is going to be, look, if people from in Europe who have remarried, and as somebody put it today, uh, they are engaged in successive polygamy, why can't a simultaneous polygamist uh, do they have the same advantages? He's, after all, in his culture, it's quite acceptable. For him, it's natural, and therefore, uh, I mean, uh, the natural law theory is that if something is natural, it's going to be, it's going to be good. There's some, it's going to be some goodness in it. So he's no conscience, no conflict of conscience about having sex in Christ and living polygamy at the same time. How are we going to deal with those? And I think that's what I meant by uh, we are going to have to take some, make some hard choices, I think. I would like to encourage all the couples who are going to get married or those who already have married, they should uh, have uh, formation, uh, uh, the pre-nuptial uh, form faith formation. Yeah. In Hong Kong, uh, uh, we already fixed such rule for all the, those uh, people, uh, young people who are going to get married. Yeah. They have to attend a certain formation courses yeah, before their marriage. But uh, after their marriage, we still encourage them. We wanted to see language in church documents changed so that it's something that gives people hope and support and encouragement rather than being something that appears to many people that they can't um, sort of meet the mark, that they can't um, live up to the standards that the church is, is uh, asking of them. When we, um, when we um, ask people to respond, 
we had a huge number of people responding for, for our country, but 25% of the respondents were, were non-practicing Catholics. And the message was that it's impossible when we're told that because we're using contraception we're intrinsically evil, or that we're living in an irregular situation, that the language is so negative that it doesn't help us. So my intervention was let's not be concentrating on rules but looking for language that helps people and encourages people in their journey to God. That's the, that's the simple message really. Um, and I think the fact that, well people appreciated the fact that they were asked, that they had an opportunity to say something at the Synod on the Family. And before I left home I was astounded at the number of people who were contacting me saying that you know there would be prayers for this. It's never happened for other synods but because it's about the family and their real life situations there was a deep interest. So the hope is that there's not going to be too many changes in doctrine but that the language that's used will be in such a way that it it is supportive and encouraging for people. And up next, we'll talk to Sebastian in Rome for more details about what's been going on behind the scenes during this first week of Synod. Did you know? There are about 250 participants at the Synod. 115 are heads of national Episcopal conferences, 13 are heads of Eastern churches, and three are superiors of religious orders. There are about 24 women participating in the Synod as invited experts and auditors. Joining me now is Sebastian Gomes. He is in Rome covering the Synod for Salt and Light. So, Sebastian, this week the Synod discussions included the issue of sacraments for divorced and civilly remarried Catholics, and they were, there was talk of the annulment process. What were the key points made in regard to those issues? Right. So remember that uh, the Synod sessions are uh, organized by theme this year, which is something new. There was a huge expectation from the outside about this particular issue, especially in our part of the world, as you know. Um, and, and yes, the Synod Fathers actually dealt with it and, and spoke about it uh, at some length uh, uh, on uh, Wednesday afternoon and Thursday morning. Uh, I, I will tell you that, that this is not an isolated um, issue. The question of marriage, obviously, is one of the central issues when you're talking about anything that has to do with the family. And we know what the Catholic Church's teaching is on, on, on the family and on marriage in particular and uh, how that sort of countercultural in many places around the world. Um, to be honest, the discussions inside the Synod Hall began to get fairly intense, uh, you know, and, and from what I can see, um, uh, there are some interventions that are, that are really making a strong, concerted push uh, for upholding the Church's, uh, you know, doctrine and speaking about it in a strong, um, a strong kind of definitive sense, um, you know, in order for, for the people, you know, around the world to kind of know clearly what the church teaches. And then there's also people saying, many bishops saying, uh, yes, we need to do that. We need to, that, that's exactly what we need to do. We also need to, to couple that with a very sensitive pastoral approach. And we need to look at exactly what the situations are that people are living in on the ground. And in that conversation, what's becoming clear is that every single situation is different. Every, every, situa every time that somebody finds themselves in a situation like that, you know, the bishops say they're all nuanced in some way. So to, to make it seems that, that they're, they're coming to the understanding that a sort of broad, um, objective, definitive statement about this issue it probably wouldn't be that helpful. So my question then is, is this really a universal church problem? Or is it really more of what we would call a first world problem? And if, it's, if it is a first world problem, so then what are the issues that are being brought up from other parts of the world? I've actually found that it is a universal issue. Now, it's not, again, it's not the only universal issue, and it might not be the most pressing issue in, in some parts of, uh, of the non-Western world, 
But even in the non-Western world, it is an issue because, uh, again, marriage and the you know the basic family as kind of the cell, the micro micro cell of, of society is so important and foundational for the health of every society. Um, now, other issues uh, that are coming up regularly are, are things like polygamy, for example. In Africa, polygamy is a major, major issue. And uh, it puts things in perspective, you know. Uh, no matter what situation you're coming from, everybody thinks that marriage is important. The question of divorce and remarried is a very serious one, even in places like Africa and Asia. But, you know, the question of polygamy, for example, is also uh, a very serious one that needs to be dealt with. Another one that's come up a lot, I'm su actually surprised at how much it's come, come up, uh, is the question of language. Like, how does the church explain its teaching on marriage, you know? And the most obvious example of that is, is trying to explain concepts of natural law for people today. I mean, people of, you know, of our generation, people who are our age, if you try to talk to them about natural law, it's like, okay, see you later, you know, no thank you. Um, so the bishops are very conscious of that, 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 that the kind of theological, um, conceptual language of how we explain very practical, tangible things dealing with human beings is, is, is not that helpful. And so there's a strong push inside the synod from the Synod Fathers uh, to kind of look at that language again and see if we can't develop it in such a way that it makes sense to modern uh, men and women. So changing gears a little bit, Sebastian, what about the general mood and the, the general atmosphere at this Synod? How are the participants themselves feeling about the process? And, you know, do they have hope that there will be concrete action over the next couple of years? Yeah, okay, I, I want to make uh, uh, two observations here uh, that I think are important. The first one is uh, it's very clear, and everybody acknowledges it, uh, that Pope Francis really set the tone for this synod by the intervention that he made right at the beginning on the first Monday morning. And people are, are, are more open to kind of saying what they really think. Uh, and they, and I, I don't think they're 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 afraid uh, to be interpreted as standing at odds against another person or this or that. I mean, it's it, these are all people who are concerned about the well-being of a lot of people in the world. <laughs> you know, we're all like we're all on the same team, so to speak. So it would be a mistake to kind of think that because there are some different differing views, um, that this is somehow you know, some political game or, or whatever. But, uh, but the atmosphere is wonderful. Uh, people are extremely cordial and respectful. There are strong disagreements. There are intense moments. Uh, but at the same time, you know that these are people that care about the people of God and care about each other. But the atmosphere all around is great. That's the first observation I would make. It's important to know that too, that Pope Francis kind of pushed um, the conversation in this direction right from the very beginning, and people have responded positively to it. The second question about something coming out of this, they are uh, well aware that they need to put something together that will make sense for people, that people can use uh, over the next year to prepare for the Ordinary Synod in 2015, uh, and to be honest about what the real issues are. Uh, and like I just said before, the, the, the freedom that, that uh, is in this particular synod will be a positive um, addition to, you know, the, the, the makeup of, or the making of that document, the preparing of that document that will be the new preparatory document for, the, for next year's synod. Thank you, Sebastian. We'll talk to you again next week. With the Synod in full swing, the Pope's schedule this week didn't really allow time for a lot of other things. But of course, he still kept his weekly appointment with the faithful for his general audience. These divisions are very painful. But we have many things in common. 
We all believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We all believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We all walk together. Let us walk together. But in all communities, we have great theologians. And there is theological truth in all of these communions. Let us walk together, praying one for the other and doing works of charity together. Because if we look for communion as we walk together, this is called spiritual ecumenism, walking the way of life together with our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Ma si dice che non si deve parlarne di cose personali. But we say we shouldn't talk about personal things. But I cannot e resist. Stiamo parlando di comunione. We're speaking about comunione fra noi. Comunion uh, between us, among us. Io sono tanto grato al Signore. And today I'm very grateful to the Lord because oggi today fa because today it's been 70 years since I made my first communion. But make, making your first communion for all of us, we should know what that means. It means to come into communion with others. It means to be in communion with our brothers and sisters in our own church, but also for, for also for with other Christians who belong to other confessions. Because we are together, we are in communion because of our baptism. And we all partake in this communion together. Cari amici, and while the Pope was occupied with the Synod, other departments kept the daily functions of the Vatican going, so there were some resignations and nominations this week. Bishop Kieran Connery of Arundel and Brighton in England resigned. It was revealed last week that he has had an affair with a woman, and he submitted his resignation. And the Roman Curia lost another member. Pope Francis has moved the Secretary of the Congregation for the Clergy to Spain. Bishop Celso Morga Iruzubieta moves from Rome to the Archdiocese of Merida Badajoz, where he will be the coadjutor and eventually Archbishop. Vatican Connections is interactive. We answer your questions and explain things you want to know. You can reach us on Twitter at Vaticanections or by email at info at saltandlighttv.org. We'll try our best to answer your questions during this part of our show. And that's it for this week's edition of Vatican Connections. Join us again next time as we continue to explore what's going on at the Synod and we look at why Paul VI is on the road to sainthood. Now, as always, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook or check our blog for regular updates. From everyone here, thanks for watching. See you next time.